In life, things happen when we have motivation, a good strategy and opportunity. What seems impossible today may be possible if we change our way of seeing things. We live in a complex world where everything is harder than it was before. Cities like Los Angeles are more complicated today than they were 20 years ago. Everything is more complicated. Additionally, we live in a fast-paced world where news reaches us instantly. Everything happens in real time, and we also live in an uncertain world. There's no point in making financial plans for 20 years from now because things change rapidly. We don't know what will happen. For example, the dollar can rise or fall at any moment, or a new pandemic could occur. These things can happen. We have to be prepared to change our strategies as things unfold. What worked in the past may not work anymore today. The one who dominates the world is not the one who knows everything, but the one who is always learning. Old knowledge may not be useful anymore. The strategies our grandparents used are not as effective nowadays. If we follow these old guidelines, we will become outdated. There was a time when people made money by selling wagon wheels and carriages, but nowadays that strategy doesn't work anymore unless you're selling tires because even museums have carriage wheels. You won't earn anything. Your great-grandfather may have made a lot of money selling carriage wheels, but that's not a profitable strategy nowadays. You need to adapt. An interesting example is that of the Chinese bamboo. After that, do a quick search about Chinese bamboo on Google. You will probably be impressed when studying and hearing the story of Chinese bamboo. Chinese bamboo is like this. In the first four years, it seemingly doesn't grow anything above the ground. But if you look closer, you'll see its roots growing vigorously below the surface. In the fifth year, suddenly, the bamboo grows 12 meters above the ground. This happens because its roots are strong enough to support this growth. This is an important lesson for our youth aspiring to financial success. You know what the big difference is? What sets a professional apart from an amateur is persistence and patience. Success doesn't happen overnight. It's as the saying goes, Rome wasn't built in a day. Young people often rush to see results, but it's important to understand that success often comes after years of hard work and patience. The example of Chinese bamboo teaches us that we need to persist and be patient to achieve our goals. Type this in the comments. I am patient to achieve my goals. Just comment this. I am patient to achieve my goals. When I see this comment, I'll give a heart because I know you are a successful person. I'm going to read you a letter that I'm sure you'll be scared to hear. Pay attention. The letter said, Your application for the doctorate has not been accepted at this time, and therefore you are not qualified for the position of associate professor. In summary, we believe your approach is more artistic than physical. These were the words received by Albert Einstein in 1903, when he tried to become a professor in Switzerland. However, this did not make him give up. He persisted. Eventually, he won the Nobel Prize and is widely considered the smartest man of the 20th century. Although there are questions about it, many people recognize the significant impact he had in the 20th century, despite being initially rejected. You know why? Because people of the time didn't fully understand what Einstein was thinking. He was years ahead of his colleagues, to the point of being rejected for a university professorship. This highlights the importance of knowledge and awareness of knowledge. I'll explain how it works. Are you paying attention? Comment like this then. I am understanding. Well, I'll start with the first point. I don't know, and I don't know that I don't know. This means there is something I don't know how to do, but I'm not aware of it. The second point. I know that I don't know. The third point. I know, but I don't know that I know. If you know, but you're not aware of it, it's as if you don't know. This is a story about a person who discovers, at the age of 75, that she is an excellent writer and publishes her first book at 76. She had a skill, but she wasn't aware of it until then. If you have a skill, but you don't know you possess it, it's as if you don't have it. And finally, we have the fourth point. When you know and are aware that you have this skill, 
This is crucial and is related to your ability to act, not just your accumulated knowledge. Imagine you're at the airport and you board a plane that will fly to New York. The flight attendant says, ladies and gentlemen, the person in the pilot's cabin is not a pilot, but has many opinions on how to fly a plane. Would you stay on the plane? Probably not. You want someone who can actually pilot. That's called competence. If you learned to swim 20 years ago and haven't practiced in a long time, you can still swim if you're placed in a pool. If you learned to ride a bike 30 years ago and haven't practiced in over 20 years, you'll be riding again soon if you're given a bike. That's action competence. Life doesn't just require the accumulation of information, but competence to act. A metaphor that has accompanied me for over 30 years is that of a person crossing a tightrope between two buildings. Three things are necessary. Will, knowledge, and opportunity, represented by the tightrope. Will is motivation, knowledge is strategy, and the tightrope is opportunity. You may want to make money and know how to do it, but if you don't have the opportunity, you won't succeed. Things happen when we combine motivation, strategy, and opportunity, and often opportunity arises when we seek it or when it presents itself disguised as a problem. Consider this story of a surgeon. It was a Friday. He was getting ready to travel with his family when suddenly he received a call from a hotel. They informed him that there was a guest with language difficulties, experiencing chest pain and sweating profusely, and asked him to attend to them as a cardiologist. He said he was about to leave for a long weekend and suggested they call another doctor. The hotel person then told him, I've already called two doctors and they gave the same answer. Faced with this, he decided to attend to this emergency. Upon arriving, he found a Polish man who didn't speak his language properly, which was Portuguese, and he spoke little English. He took the man to the hospital, performed an electrocardiogram, and found out that he was having a heart attack. During the journey to the hospital, the man asked the surgeon, Do you know my son? And the doctor asked back, Who is your son? And he replied, My son is the head of cardiology at Harvard named Peter Morocco. The doctor replied, I don't personally know your son, but I know his books very well. And much of what I know about my profession, I learned from reading his books. Look at what's interesting coming up next. 48 hours later, his son flew from Boston, Massachusetts to the hospital where his father was. Surprisingly, he was married to a Brazilian from Americana, Sao Paulo, and spoke Portuguese. So the doctors became friends. To summarize the story, the doctor who was going to travel decided not to because a last minute problem came up. And in solving that problem, he met a very important person. In the end, he ended up receiving a great opportunity to lecture at Harvard, not by merit, but by the opportunity life provided him on that day he was called. No one told him that he would attend the son of the head of cardiology at Harvard, that he would come to Brazil, and that he would be invited to lecture at Harvard. He simply knew that he needed to attend to someone at that moment, and that he would need to postpone the trip he was going to take. Learn this. Opportunity often disguises itself as a problem. Behind challenges, there are opportunities waiting to be discovered. This is something we need to teach young people. To learn to like problems because they can be our best friends. Perhaps the great opportunity you're seeking is hidden behind the problems you're avoiding so much. Another thing you should learn is that we will never have a second chance to make a good first impression. The first three or four minutes when meeting someone can make a huge difference depending on how we behave. I'll illustrate this in another way. There are two types of power, positional power, which comes from the position we hold, such as being an army general where everyone salutes us, and personal power, which is linguistic and doesn't depend on position. You can lose positional power, such as ceasing to be CEO of a company. But personal power is something that always remains. For example, if an army general goes to a bakery in shorts and flip-flops, no one will recognize him because he's not wearing his attire that demonstrates his positional power. But his personal power will always be visible. As soon as he opens his mouth, it will manifest. 
I could make a complete video just talking about personal power. If you want a video like that, then comment. I want to know more about personal power. It's important to teach people about personal power because it's fundamental and always manifests when we start to speak. Life has the habit of surprising us with both good and bad things, and we need to be open to this perspective. Everything that's important in our lives often appears when we least expect it at a 90 degree angle. If I asked you about the three best things that have happened in your life so far, I can guarantee that at least two of them were not planned. You didn't wake up one day and decide, today I'm going to meet someone I'll start dating, fall in love with and marry. Instead, you went somewhere, met someone, started dating and eventually got married. Things happened but they weren't planned, right? Similarly, the job you're working at today didn't come because you said, from today on, I'm going to work for that company. No, it didn't happen like that. You sent a resume and went through an interview. Suddenly you thought you would be called for the job. But a few days passed and there you go, the phone rings. It's someone telling you that you got the job. Life surprises us in unexpected ways. We need to be open to this perspective because important things in life often happen unexpectedly. The importance of goals isn't just in achieving them, but in getting us moving. During this process, much more significant things can happen at unexpected angles. For example, you can go to the supermarket to buy a kilogram of sugar, and while waiting in line to pay, you start talking to someone. That person may give you an idea that results in a great financial success, like earning a million dollars. You didn't go to the supermarket intending to have that lucrative idea, but it arose during a casual conversation. Therefore, it's essential to keep an open mind because life has the power to surprise us. Our minds are like parachutes. They only work when they're open. If your parachute doesn't open, you risk getting hurt. Likewise, for the mind to function properly, it needs to be kept open. Unfortunately, we often learn in college a series of prejudices about knowledge and assume that everything we've learned is absolutely true. Never allow the things you can't do to hinder what you can do. Often we get stuck in limitations and tell ourselves, oh, I can't do this or that or the other. But what really matters is focusing on what we can do with the knowledge we have and in the situation we're in. You need to start somewhere. You can't wait to be perfect before taking the first step. The best teacher is the universe itself, which teaches us through our own experience. Of course, learning from others' experiences can accelerate our progress, but there's nothing stopping us from learning for ourselves. Today, more than ever, self-learning is essential. You need to learn on your own, because if you rely solely on a teacher to teach you, you'll only go as far as that teacher went. Learning to learn on your own is very important, and today YouTube is there with a lot of knowledge available for you to learn every day. Look at you here, consuming our content, that's wonderful. Have a thirst for learning and seek to learn on your own whenever possible. The sky's the limit, and your potential will be the only limit. It's important to recognize that not everyone is born with the same potential, and many of humanity's greatest talents go to waste. These are people who couldn't explore all their potential during their lives. I believe that if you have potential, it's important to exercise it. When we transcend beyond this life, our cosmic address will be determined by how much we leveraged our potential and learned during our journey. Up there, when you're confronted about what you did with your potential and abilities, you'll be charged with not having made use of them. It's like in the Bible, where there's a parable about it. I'm talking about the parable of the talents. Let me teach you one more thing. Pay attention. Imagine a fish that never left the water. Does it know that it lives in water? No. If it has never experienced anything beyond water, it doesn't know what it's like to live outside it. For it to understand that it lives in water, it would need the experience of living outside it. Since it has never left the water, it lacks that awareness. This analogy can be applied to the concept of a paradigm. In the past, it was believed that the earth was flat. Ships sailed the seas, and many believed that eventually they would reach a point where they would fall off the edge of the world. 
The sailors' wives went to the port to bid farewell to their husbands dressed in mourning, as most did not return. Many died during the voyages, often from scurvy due to vitamin C deficiency. When the idea that the earth was round emerged, the paradigm changed. Before, it was impossible to conceive a trip around the world in a flat world. Now, with the understanding that the earth is round, trips around the world are possible. The paradigm changed. It's truly fascinating to observe how, when the paradigm shifts from a flat world to a round world, possibilities multiply. What seems impossible in your life today is impossible within the paradigm you're living in. However, if you change the paradigm, possibilities expand. Whenever something seems impossible, remember that this impossibility is within the current paradigm. If you change that paradigm, as happened with the understanding of the shape of the Earth, new possibilities will arise, such as trips around the world. It's essential to understand the cause to be able to reproduce the effect. You can make money and become rich by being in the right place at the right time, but think about it. If someone else were in your place, could they also earn that amount? Was it entirely your merit or would anyone else do it? So let's apply a test. If all your money were taken away from you, would you be able to recover it? This demonstrates whether you truly know the path to success. If you don't know the cause behind your success, you won't be able to reproduce the effects in life. So if you care about your health, remember that it's your greatest wealth. There's a very important doctor, Dr. Pre and post-operative for Dr. Michael DeBack Hilston, a renowned cardiac surgeon who received over a hundred patients a day. Many of these patients were multimillionaires, even arriving in their own planes with several bodyguards. However, in their interactions with the doctor, they expressed a desire to give everything they had to regain their health. They recognized that health is true wealth and were willing to sacrifice their entire fortune to recover it. It's true that often we don't give proper value to our health. If you don't make time to take care of it, one day you'll have to find time to deal with illness. If you're always too busy to take care of your health, know that eventually you'll have to deal with the consequences of that neglect. Let me propose a scenario for you to imagine. Imagine that right now, I give you a pearl as a gift. You hold it for a moment, look at it, and put it in your pocket. A week later, we meet again, and I give you another pearl. Once again, you take it, glance briefly at it, and put it in your pocket. Fifteen days later, we meet for the third and final time, and I give you the third pearl. Again, you put it in your pocket. Months go by, and we meet again. I ask, where are the pearls I gave you? You tell me something like this. I put the first pearl on the nightstand, but the person who cleans my house didn't see it and threw it away. The second pearl I forgot in my pants pocket, which went to the laundry and came back without the pearl. And as for the third pearl, you won't believe it. I hid it from myself. I kept it so well that I don't even know where it is. It's so well hidden that I'll never find it again. Imagine if, instead of giving you the pearls that you ended up losing, I gave you a simple nylon thread and instructions to create a necklace with them. When we met months later and I asked about the pearls, you could reply, they're here, I turned them into a necklace. My friends, pearls represent ideas. The cemetery is full of people who had great ideas, but didn't put them into practice, or worse, tried to implement them and failed. A good idea can ruin a person, a company, or a family. In the end, what matters are not the pearls, but the nylon thread that holds them. In the field of medicine, I see many professionals with great medical knowledge, but without adequate models. When a patient presents themselves, they may have all the knowledge, but if a model is lacking, they can't make the diagnosis. Having knowledge is like having pearls, but without the nylon thread to sustain them and make a difference. It's the presence of models that truly matters. In the power of knowledge, having models is much more crucial than knowledge itself because models stay with us forever, while information disappears from our minds, just like pearls. Let's talk now about growing in life. Here's an example. Have you ever seen a rocking chair? 
Do you know where a rocking chair goes? Nowhere. Do you know why? It rocks. If you put more energy into it, it rocks more. But the problem is it doesn't move. You must know people like that. You meet them, time passes, you meet them again, and they're in the same place. And they say, this time things will work out. This time it will, it didn't. This time it will, it didn't. And so on. Now another example, a Formula One car. The Formula One car, as you know, is like a plane. It doesn't have reverse gear. It only moves forward. It's made to advance. So a person can have a psychological structure like a rocking chair, and you must know many, and a person can have a psychological structure like a Formula One car. If a person has a psychological structure like a rocking chair, the first thing I have to do with them is to change their psychological structure because knowledge coming from outside won't solve the problem. It won't turn a rocking chair into a Formula One car. So this is knowledge that makes all the difference. So I developed a model that I want to share, a problem-solving model that will serve you for the rest of your life. I gathered the 300 or so people who reported to my department and told them the following. From today on, you only come into my office if you can answer four questions. First, I'll ask you what the problem is. Defined problem, 50% solved. You must know this saying, a defined problem, 50% solved. I've been in meetings like you have, where after 40 minutes, everyone has a different problem in mind. Defining the problem is crucial to solving it. Then I'll ask you a second question. What are the causes of the problem? If your front right tire is wearing out and you change the tire and it wore out again and you change the tire and it wore out again, it's better to align the wheels because the problem is in the wheel alignment. Then your front right tire won't wear out anymore. What are the causes? Of course, when I ask them what the causes are, they start working, they start working as a team. Third, I'll ask you what are the possible solutions, because one will talk to another, will ask, another will consider, what is everyone's opinion, what is the best solution? Look at that, the guy is ready to come into my office to bother me. Then he said, well, Dr. Eden will ask me four questions. He'll ask me what the problem is, what the causes of the problem are, what the possible solutions are, and in my opinion, what's the best? Well, what's the problem? He will define it. Defined problem, 50% solved. He will see what the causes are. He will talk to his colleagues. He will identify the causes. He will see what the possible solutions are. He will call a consultant and ask what he thinks. And finally, he will decide in his opinion what the best solution is. Do you know what conclusion he will come to? I don't need to go to Dr. Aiden. Look, I solved it myself. So people stopped coming to bother me during the day because they learned to do it. Take this as a gift because it will leverage what you have in terms of knowledge in life in any personal or professional situation. An eagle can see a fish below the water's surface 500 meters away and it goes and grabs it, catches the fish. Another example is the owl. The eagle is very good during the day, but it doesn't see anything at night. The owl, on the other hand, doesn't see anything during the day, but it has one of the best night visions. What do you think is better? Do you want to have the vision of an eagle, or do you want to have the vision of an owl? I would say the following. If I'm dealing with daytime problems, I want to have eagle vision. If the problem is nocturnal, I want to have owl vision. It depends on the context, on the process. Many times I'll be able to solve the problem. Many times I have to have the humility to delegate. Once they asked Charles Darwin, the father of the theory of evolution, and asked like this, Dr. Darwin, if you could summarize your entire theory in one sentence, what would you say? He replied, I would say it's not the strongest or the most intelligent species that will survive, but the ones with the greatest ability to adapt. It's not the strongest or most intelligent, but those who adapt better. It's not the strongest or most intelligent companies that will survive, but those that have the greatest ability to adapt. An example of this was a clothing factory during the last pandemic. They were no longer selling their goods because all the stores were closed. If the stores close, the factories don't profit. So if I can't manufacture clothes, I'll manufacture face masks. Notice the power of adaptation. 
Many factories that didn't adapt went bankrupt during the pandemic, but many grew through adaptation. Let's see this other example. An oak tree after a storm, the oak tree tried to resist the storm. The storm tore it from the ground with its roots. With bamboo, it's very different, which is much weaker than the oak tree. But when the wind and the storm came, it adapted to what was happening. It bent, it bowed, and it remains intact on the ground. The oak tree, which is much stronger than bamboo, is going down the drain, and bamboo persists and prevails. So, this capacity for adaptation is part of the power of knowledge. I have to have this ability to adapt to the context that is happening. If you liked this video and stayed until the end, type in the comments, I stayed until the end. When I see this comment, I'll give you a little heart because I know you're a resilient person. Now two videos full of knowledge are appearing on your screen that I'm sure will add a lot of value to your life, so click and watch it now.